Paul and I go way back, and uh, we often co-teach in my uh, MA Science Seminar at Columbia Journalism School. Uh, Paul is one of the world's leading dinosaur experts, so it's really exciting to watch a Jurassic movie with Paul Olson in attendance. When, and, Jonathan, uh, when, when yes. I co-teach with you in, in journalism, one of the things I learn about that is how to communicate uh, science. And we've done this for many years, and you could tell this because we're constantly referred to as senior <laughs> yes, I, I, went, I noticed that senior also. Yeah, it's, like, uh, it's four or five times, I think. I know. <laughs> so um, it's all about storytelling. It's all about storytelling for, for scientists, for science writers, obviously for Hollywood. And uh, I thought maybe I would kick things off a little bit by talking about uh, the theory of evolution and one of the most extraordinary real life adventures that is uh, unfolding now and has been unfolding for, for decades in Darwin's Islands and the Galapagos Islands. So uh, I've often said that uh, when I embarked on that book, The Beak of the Finch, I knew so little about evolution that I didn't realize that it was controversial. Uh, but uh, I was talking very excitedly about the project I was launching into, which would mean that I'd get to go visit these sort of swashbuckling scientists on a desert island uh, uh, hundreds of miles off the coast of Ecuador, the Galapagos Islands. I talked about that at a dinner party. And afterwards, someone, uh, someone came up to me by the uh, coat closet and said, did I hear you saying you're writing about evolution? And I said, yeah. And uh, she said, are you for it or against it? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, it was my first intimation that roughly half this country is against it, uh, slightly less than half these days. but about half. This is back in 1990, and the polls have been pretty steady right around that, year after year. So a week later, I went to the dentist for just the standard uh, teeth cleaning, and the dental hygienist was masked. So I'm lying there in the dentist chair. The hygienist is bending over me with her mask. She's got her hands in my mouth, and she says, so Jonathan, what are you working on now? And I said, evolution. And she bends even closer and she stares into my eyes and she says, I'm a Jehovah's Witness, so you know what I think about that. And I really didn't feel like, ah, didn't feel like I was in any position to argue. So I wrote the book. I kept running into uh, uh, strange encounters like that, to me strange. And um, at the very end, the last chapter, uh, I had pulled an all-nighter writing it, and this is still back in the early 90s before the internet, when if you were going to rush a manuscript to an editor in New York from Pennsylvania, where I lived then in a small town, you had to get it to FedEx by the FedEx drop-off deadline. That was a hard deadline. And my computer froze on me before I could print out the last chapter. And I absolutely had to print it out. It was, by chance, a chapter called God in the Galapagos. <laughs> <laughs> and the computer froze. So I race it to a Computer Forum, which was the local Apple store. And there's just one guy there. Uh, it, the place is already closed, but he sees me looking piteously through the glass door. He unlocks the door, lets me in. I explain the situation, the book, the chapter, last chapter, the computer's frozen. So he's a technician there. Uh, he starts working on it. It's a hardware problem. Pretty soon, my computer, like half my computer, is barfed out across the counter. And he's still futzing with it, and he says, so what's your book about? And I still hadn't learned, so I just said with the same enthusiasm, evolution, evolution. And uh, there's this long pause. 
And he looks at me across the debris of my machine and he says, well, I have a PhD in engineering and I can tell you that this planet and all the living things on it were created within the last, I forget, within the last 5,000 years, pretty much in the form we see them now. So we just stood there and looked at each other and then out of a wonderful sense of charity, he continued to fix my computer and I was able to print it out by the deadline and get it in. You know, Jonathan, it's funny you mentioned that. When I was a child in New Jersey, uh, Jehovah Witnesses used to come by the house on a fairly regular basis and I would debate them. Uh -huh. uh, and, <laughs> and I think that that actually was an enormous impetus for me to, to really get involved in natural history and, and to understand differing point, points of view and how to talk in a reasonable way and not, you know, not just stand there and, 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 uh, and glare at each other, but uh -huh. actually to have a conversation. And they were always very nice too. Yeah. So I've benefited from that tremendously. That's terrific. Yeah. I grew up in uh, northern Jersey also and we're, I think, exactly the same age. And I probably remember the same Jehovah's Witnesses coming by probably to our house, ones. probably on the same day, on the same route. So this is why I was so uh, surprised, so puzzled by the statistic that half the country doesn't, doesn't believe in evolution because the scientists that I was visiting in these islands, the Galapagos Islands, were watching evolution happen in Darwin's Islands with Darwin's finches. Uh, Darwin once called the Galapagos the origin of all my views. So this is the origin of the origin of species. Uh, there they are, the, the Galapagos archipelago in the map that um, was made by the Beagle. The Beagle was a surveying voyage when it carried Darwin around the world in September and October of 1835 he was tromping around in the Galapagos. And we picture him, you know, as an old man, as an old sage with that uh, wonderful beard, uh, kind of familiar almost as George Washington on the dollar bill, as David Quammen says in uh, the introduction to his very good short biography of Darwin, if you're interested, I recommend it, called The Reluctant Mr. Darwin. But in fact, he was young when he went on this voyage. He, was, he stepped right out of college onto the Beagle and, uh, and traveled around the world, which was an adventure comparable to being an astronaut today. This is the route the, that the Beagle took. And there's the Galapagos Islands and the route that the ship traveled. And that little desert island Daphne Major, you can see it sort of center left there, and you can see that the zigzag course of the Beagle missed it completely. So he never even saw Daphne Major. He did see the spectacular, spectacular landscape of the Galapagos. He had enormous adventures. He rode around on a Galapagos tortoise on the back. He swam with the sea lions. He swam with the marine iguanas. Oh, and that, that, I think that marine iguana pretty much captures most people's idea of what a dinosaur should look like. Yeah. But we'll see that's not right. <laughs> but they're, fab they're fabulous animals to see. Uh, he also pulled the tail of a land iguana and uh, the iguana sort of mild-manneredly just looked at him like, what made you pull my tail? Uh, and he read this classic, the whole time on the voyage, he was reading Paradise Lost, which, um, as you probably know, uh, is a celebration of the view of creation as written in the book of Genesis, in which all living things were created more or less in the form they are now. So it was only he, after he got back from the Galapagos and got home to London and started looking at his specimens and thinking things through that he began to question that orthodox view that he had been taught in school and that everyone around him pretty much took for granted. And uh, he began writing what he thought of as secret notebooks. This is the single most famous page in which uh, he begins to think that 
all of life could be related in, in a gigantic family tree. Um, one generation leading to another, divergence, the origin of new species driven by the mechanism he eventually comes up with, natural selection. And he writes across the top with charming scientist's modesty, I think. It's just a hypothesis still. He's going to do a lot more work on it before he's willing to take it out of the realm of the secret notebooks. So in the late 1830s, some years after the voyage, he publishes an account, Journal of Researches into the Geology and Natural History of the Various Countries Visited by HMS Beagle, 1839, about the age he was in that young portrait that we just saw before. And here, he includes these birds that have come to be thought of as Darwin's finches. And he says something really provocative and even beautiful. He was sometimes a clunky writer, sometimes really a beautiful writer. And he wrote about them. Hence, both in space and time, we seem to be brought somewhat near to that great fact, that mystery of mysteries, the first appearance of new beings on this earth. It's a pretty broad hint of what he's thinking about in the secret notebooks, but that is as far as he goes. Partly because he has fallen in love with his cousin, Emma Wedgwood, who is a devout woman who would be afraid that her husband, Charles Darwin, was going to go to hell if he was explicit about his views of where species come from and how life evolves. So for years more, he works on this theory, developing all kinds of arguments and evidence, phenomenally industrious and phenomenally careful, before finally uh, confessing to a botanist friend, Joseph Hooker. Uh, it, it's like confessing a murder, he says, that he's thinking about evolution by natural selection, rather than the view in Paradise Lost. So, I'm going to riff through very quickly to give you an impression of the adventure that Peter and Rosemary Grant of Princeton had in the Galapagos Islands. There's the origin of species, finally, 1859. So you see, it's a lapse of 20 years of essentially silence on this subject between that hint in the Voyage of the Beagle, as we call it now, and then the origin of species. Um, Here's another reason why he was so cautious, so careful about publishing and waited those 20 years. He says in the first chapter of The Origin, we see nothing of these slow changes in progress until the hand of time has marked the lapse of ages, geological ages, millions of years. He assumed that's how long you would have to be around and watching in order to see evolution in action. So Daphne Major, is an island, a desert island, as I said. Much of the year, it's desert, as in that top picture. But when the rains come in the wet season, it turns pretty green, almost overnight. And Peter Grant and his wife, Rosemary Grant, began watching Darwin's finches very carefully in the Galapagos way back in 1972. Uh, here's a picture in 88. The birds are easy to keep track of in the Galapagos because they're really not afraid of human beings. You can see that Galapagos hawk is treating Peter uh, as if he were a cactus there. And I can see why he's wearing a hat. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, finches, Darwin's finches, would land on their teacups and coffee cups. Uh, uh, they were inspecting Peter and Rosemary while, they, while Peter and Rosemary were studying them. And uh, I'm going to go just a little bit faster, but it's not an easy place to do a study. And they were raising two little girls at the beginning of this study. It's steep as a roof all the way around. You could fall and roll down and land, fall off the cliff and land among the sharks. There's the cliffs. Daphne Minor is the nearest island off on the, uh, off there. There's only one place to land, which I called in my book the welcome mat. And only one little shallow cave where they could park all of their supplies because there's no food and water for human beings on this island. 
There's Daphne Minor. You can see even more forbidding. And what they did was they measured the beaks of the finches, and they measured the finches uh, in many different dimensions. Um, each individual, each generation, generation after generation, and they focused on this guy with a parrot-like beak, which is Gspiza magnorostris, the big beak ground finch. There's uh, uh, a magnorostris cracking a tough seed that other, other birds with smaller beaks can't crack. Uh, you can see the massive beak there. And they also looked at Fortis, the medium beak ground finch, and you can see the difference in the beaks, right? So I visited the islands, and uh, it was one of the great adventures of my life to visit uh, Peter and Rosemary in, in action there. Peter led me up to the top of the volcano. You see two masked boobies courting there right at Peter's feet, uh, the birds. None of the animals is afraid of human beings. It's an extraordinary Garden of Eden kind of experience. And Rosemary, at the top of the volcano, had just caught this cactus finch uh, uh, in a have-a-heart trap. And they were, I was able to watch as they did all those measurements that, um, that are the key to their very careful study. There's Peter calling off measurement numbers, Rosemary writing them down in a waterproof, waterproof notebook. And they are, of course, studying dinosaurs. It's a good point. I was saying to Paul before we started, um, you know, it's not dinosaurs, but it's a thrilling adventure. And Paul said, it is dinosaurs. More about that in a minute. They also banned the birds to make them easier to spot once they release them. So they know, they knew, they're retired now, but they knew every finch on the island year after year after year, individually. There they are taking a mug shot of the cactus finch that they had just measured. Rosemary's clicking her fingers to catch its attention. Peter's taking the picture. If Peter took one step further away from my camera, he would fall all the way down into the Pacific. If I took one step back, I would have fallen down into the crater of this extinct volcano. But they were totally cool and casual about it. And as I left, uh, they gave me an airmail letter to send to one of their daughters, uh, to Nicola, uh, which was the only way at that time they could communicate with the outside world if somebody stopped by. And Rosemary and Peter noticed that a great big shark was circling around the boat that I was about to get on. And for some reason, they thought that was very funny. Is that <laughs> no, that's uh, uh, a guy who was um, one of the naturalists who was helping to show us around the islands. I was traveling with another biologist, a former student of Peter and Rosemary's. I didn't look that different from that back then, though. So. It was a tough time on the island then. It's often a tough time if you're a finch uh, or any other um, uh, bird obliged to forage on the bare lava during, during droughts. In January of 77, there were 1,200 fortis, the medium beaks, on Daphne. And by December of that year, there were fewer than 300 left. And to make the story short, which is really uh, uh, magnificently intricate, uh, but in brief, the result of, uh, of that incredibly strong selection pressure, as it's known in evolutionary biology, was that the generation before the drought, typically the Fortis had a beak like that on the left, and their kids, the offspring, had beaks that are, as you can see, visibly larger and more parrot-like because they were the ones who were able to crack those last tough seeds on the island that no one else was able to crack. So um, the, um, the drought of that year showed Peter and Rosemary and their grad students that you could, in fact, watch evolution by natural selection and in Darwin's islands, and with Darwin's finches. So Peter and Rosemary kept doing this work 
uh, on into their old age. Uh, they really did grow old in the islands with this study. They, they worked in the islands for a good 40 years. Now they're retired, but they still collaborate with others and study the DNA of the finches and how that's evolving. Learned a huge amount about evolution. It's a classic study now in evolutionary biology. And in 2009, which was the 150th anniversary of the publication of The Origin of Species, they announced in the Proceedings of the Royal Society, a very prestigious uh, journal, that they had witnessed the origin of a new species of Darwin's finch, which they call informally Big Bird. There's a specimen of Big Bird there. So it's a totally cool story of uh, the fulfillment of Darwin's vision and all of his theorizing and careful gathering of data way back in the 1800s, and then arriving in our time at this incredible, detailed, literally granular, if you look at the picture, <laughs> granular understanding of what it means on the ground. Uh, and so that line from The Voyage of the Beagle turns out to be prophetic. So very briefly, I, uh, I wrote this book hoping I would be able to reach a popular audience with the book, even that, though it's a serious book. Oh, you're going to answer this in a second. Yeah. You're going to say that's what you won your Pulitzer Prize for. Uh, yeah, that's right. The Beak of the Finch did win the, the Pulitzer and some other honors. And it also reached a pretty good audience. And, uh, and I knew that it, it had gotten into the popular culture in the way that I had hoped on this night when the question was, uh, what's uh, the beak of you know, uh, this bird? And it was Glenn who got the answer. <laughs> so there we go. It reached, it reached some way into the popular culture, which is what you hope for and what um, this film, uh, in its way, does extraordinarily well. So uh, just to conclude, if you care about this, you care about it a lot. There are people walking around with Darwin's Finch tattoos. There are also people walking around with, I think, and Darwin's famous diagram tattooed. Um, and that conversation that I had by the coat closet is perfectly apropos of what we're talking about here. Because the woman I was talking to who said, are you for it or against it, said after I explained that you can see Darwin's finches evolving from year to year, she said, ah, but that's, they're still birds. That's still each according to his kind. They, uh, they're created each according to his kind in the book of Genesis, and that's how they remain. Um, it's not, in fact, uh, true that um, evolution is limited to the fine tuning that you can see in the course of 40 years. It can, as we just saw, create a new species. And if you allow 40,000 or 400,000 or 40 million uh, or more, you can get pretty far. So what I've been talking about is microevolution. What Paul studies in the fossil record is macroevolution, and he'll show us how uh, macroevolution works in, in all its spectacular, epic glory. Uh, but that, that shows us how you can get from a creature that looks something like this to a creature more familiar that looks something like that. And I hope that uh, this, <laughs> this too will reach a wide audience. So all right, over to you, Paul. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Sure. So, you know, it, it is still one of the great debates, and because you can't observe it, in a human time scale, still a mystery to, to many people. I, it's worth mentioning that what's happening with COVID right now uh, is extremely rapid evolution. And I'm heartened to see that in general, the press does refer to it as evolution. 
uh, and we have the evolution of various new variants and so forth who are evolving to literally coexist with us rather than wiping out every individual that it infects. So let's, uh, let's begin talking about, uh, about uh, dinosaurs. And Jonathan has, of course, been talking about dinosaurs all this time because anyone who's been reading or looking at the press or even watching the Jurassic Park movies knows that it is understood by scientists that birds have descended from theropods, that is, the carnivorous group of dinosaurs. And during the time of Darwin, and even before that, the idea that there were varieties of, or of uh, individuals within a species or even separate varieties that were distinct from each other was a commonly pretty well understood phenomenon. It, the mechanism for that was provided by Darwin, but the fact that there were these varieties were well known, otherwise you couldn't have uh, artificial breeding. However, what uh, the biggest conceptual hurdle that Darwin faced was that Darwin was arguing that through the accumulation over innumerable years and eons, that the variations that you could see amongst within a species would ultimately lead to not just new species, but entirely new kinds of organisms that looked very, very different. So in the 18th century and early 19th century, on the left we have Cuvier, Georges Cuvier of France, 18th century master uh, comparative anatomist and his successor, the British uh, Sir Richard Owen, who was an equally brilliant scientist. And they argued that in the grand scheme of nature, in the grand scheme of nature, organisms were broken into separate architectures, separate uh, arrangements of body plans that were uh, holistically viable, and you could not get from one plant to another, each of its own kind. So that uh, they, Owen, for example, who was contemporaneous with Darwin, despised natural selection. Because while he argued that evolution could occur, it was always within a group, like the finches that you see here. And that they, as Jonathan said, were still birds. And the bird plan could not be violated. Darwin argued that that wasn't the case, that you could bridge those back gaps. But Darwin also recognized that fundamentally the fossil record did not support his argument. There were, at the time, no intermediates known between these different archetypes. And so uh, you had trouble getting conceptually from a lizard-type form, a reptile, to a bird. Um, Darwin's uh, friend, Thomas Henry Huxley, in uh, 1861, two years after Darwin's Origin of Species, recognized that two fossils that had been found just after the Origin of Species, the uh, earliest bird, Archaeopteryx, and a small, somewhat similar dinosaur named Compsognathus, were actually, in Huxley's words, a missing link between reptiles and birds. And the fact that that fossil existed, and that fossil, as Huxley noted, was a dinosaur, Owen, having named the dinosauria in 1842, this was confirmation in the view of both Huxley and Darwin that, in fact, these intermediates did exist. Because by comparative anatomy that Cuvier or Owen would have recognized, birds were more are more similar to reptiles than they are to, say, mammals. And so were there a intermediate to exist, it would be expected to have certain features. And those features, as noted by Huxley, existed in those fossils. And those fossils had not been discovered when Darwin came up with his theory. So these fossils showed uh, to Huxley that birds were actually descendants of what we would call dinosaurs with Owen having provided the name. One of the current themes of research now at the cusp of our understanding is the realization that even though Huxley and Darwin understood the links between birds, dinosaurs, and other reptiles, all being reptiles by modern classification, 
that now we recognize that our basic concept of what a dinosaur is, a non-bird dinosaur, is fundamentally wrong. Non-bird dinosaurs have adaptations for dealing with cold. Now, they're not basically tropical animals that you see them in, in uh, most pictures, like in Jurassic Park 1. They are fundamentally adapted to living in colder conditions. They were from their outset, which you see on the left, in the Triassic and earliest Jurassic, in the Cretaceous with this northern uh, feathered tyrannosaur, and today, which you see with these Arctic birds. They have insulation which allows them to survive in those intense environments. Didn't you just publish a paper about that? I did. I had a paper in Science Advances called Ice and the Ecological Scent of the Dinosaurs that shows that early dinosaurs lived in the, in the high Arctic uh, in freezing conditions year-round. Uh, and actually, that's the work of my graduate student showing the uh, uh, Claire up there, uh, showing that uh, there was a, what's called ice rafted debris that shows that it was freezing. And then another graduate student up there, Bennett, uh, Bennett Slybeck, who works on dinosaur footprints. And together, we're, we're, we're working on these ideas. And, but before we go any farther, farther, we have to cover some very basic stuff. Like, what is a dinosaur anyway? So I want to ask you as an audience, is, is, is this a dinosaur? Yes, no, yes. OK, so you got to be a little louder. Shout it out. So that is not a dinosaur. That is a, an animal that's actually more closely related to us than a dinosaur. How about this? Yes. OK, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Don't want to step out of getting too enthusiastic. Yes. Um, so this is not a dinosaur. This is a very close relative of a dinosaur. And the hint that it's a close relative is what you see covering its body, which are filaments, insulation. But it's not a dinosaur. How about this? Yeah, yeah. yeah you betcha. That's a dinosaur. Uh, and uh, that's one of the largest ones we know. That's the famous titanosaur at the American Museum of Natural History. How about this? This is a dinosaur? <laughs> yeah, it, it, these are dinosaurs. You bet they are. They're as much of a dinosaur as a bat as a mammal. How about that? I hear a lot of yeses. Actually, no. First of all, it's about 10 times the size it actually was, as depicted in Jurassic Park franchises. That is a mosasaur, which is basically a very large marine lizard, true lizard. Dinosaurs are not lizards. So what is a dinosaur? A dinosaur is an animal more closely related to birds than it is crocodiles. And it includes things that have a hole in their hip sockets. So if you look in the upper uh, left-hand corner, you see a dinosaur skeleton and its hip. That hip has a hole in it for where the, the, uh, the, up, the thigh bone goes. Uh, human beings, which you see on the right, don't have that. So forward is in the arrow that you see. Uh, the, the hole in the hip socket is called the acetabulum. That's the cup that the femur sits in. And dinosaurs are the specialization of having that open. That's inherited by modern birds. Uh, and these are the various bones. And we share them because that's something called homology, which we'll get to in a second. So just to touch on the landmarks of dinosaurian existence. We had them arise about 232 million years ago in the Triassic period. And that's uh, Herrerasaurus, one of the earliest known dinosaurs from South America. We had lots of small ones around the world during the Triassic, like Coelophysis from New Mexico and Arizona. Uh, by the end Triassic, there was a mass extinction. Uh, and right after that, dinosaurs basically took over the planet with much larger forms like Dilophosaurus, who makes various appearances, and sometimes at very critical times, in the Jurassic Park movies, as we shall see. Then we have uh, Brontosaurus, the famous and iconic, very large sauropod dinosaur in the late Jurassic, along with the oldest known bird, Archaeopteryx, which has characteristic bird-type feathers. Uh, and all of these dinosaurs, with the exception of the sauropod here, are shown with feathers. Uh, and then around the early part of the Cretaceous, about 125 million years ago, you have animals like Sinoceropteryx, which is the very first dinosaur found that clearly, non-avian dinosaur, non-bird dinosaur found, that clearly had insulation in the form of feathers. And then Deinonychus, terrible claw, 
found by John Ostrom in the 1960s. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. And Spinosaurus, the largest carnivore that we know of ever to have lived on land. Velociraptor, a very a much smaller version of Deinonychus. And then, of course, the famous Tyrannosaurus rex. And then at the close of the Cretaceous, we had an asteroid impact that wiped out all but the bird-type dinosaurs. So how do we know about dinosaurs? Well, one of the most obvious ways we know about non-bird dinosaurs is from fossils. You see a former Columbia student here, Diego Paul, uh, acting a scale to the, uh, to the uh, uh, femur of um, uh, the titanosaur that's at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, but there are other ways we find out about dinosaurs. So there's this thing called homology, which are structures that are shared between organisms that have the same basic uh, position and, and, uh, and developmental uh, processes, uh, even if they're in totally different environments. You can see comparison of the bones of a, of a manatee and a bat. And then from these homologies, we make hypotheses of relationships of organisms using those features. Uh, and those hypotheses make predictions for features that we don't know about yet. And then those, those, uh, those hypotheses make predictions which can be tested in the fossil record and can be falsified, or in this case, confirmed by actual fossils with those features, which you don't know about when you make the hypothesis. So they're testable hypotheses. And of course, another really essential element in understanding and figuring out dinosaurs is imagination. You have to have a lot of imagination. And there's this interesting interplay between art and, uh, and scientific discoveries in dinosaurs and popular culture as well. Where we don't get information about the evolutionary relationships of dinosaurs from DNA from uh, insects in amber. These famous mosquitoes, like in, uh, in like John Hammond here in Jurassic Park One, with the, his little cane with the with the uh, with the mosquito with dinosaur Tyrannosaurus rex blood in it. We don't do that. That does not happen. DNA does not last that long. If it, the oldest DNA, I believe, is about seven hundred thousand years old, not seventy million years old. But every so often, an unfortunate dinosaur did find its way, or at least part of it, into amber. This is an actual dinosaur tail with dinosaur non-bird type feathers with a long bony tail and long filaments from Burmese amber and a reconstruction of that dinosaur above. What about sizes in the most famous dinosaurs? So here's a comparison of various sizes of dinosaurs with the sauropods like Supersaurus or Amphicelus being the largest, and then uh, Carnivores like Spinosaurus being the largest, larger than T. rex or Giganotosaurus. Uh, it used to be thought that the blue whale was the largest animal ever to have lived, but the largest sauropods give it a run for its money. And the whale, of course, is a mammal that's buoyed up in water while the, the sauropods lived on land. Well, what about the smallest dinosaur in the world? Well, there it is on the left, the bee hummingbird. Beautiful little creature. And the smartest dinosaur, the great parrot. Oh, anybody know the name of this particular dinosaur? It's a pretty famous one. That's Alex. Alex was able to seemingly use words in a contextual sense in terms of language. And also count, recognize the concept of zero, and various other massive intellectual feats we usually don't associate with either birds or all dinosaurs in general. So let's talk a bit about Velociraptor, the famous dinosaur in the Jurassic Park franchise. Uh, it's actually based, and Michael Crichton would tell people this, that it was actually based on a dinosaur named Deinonychus. Deinonychus comes from uh, Montana, from the early Cretaceous period. And Deinonychus is known from a few skeletons, this particular one as the, one of the most complete known, and it was sold at Christie's for $12.4 million this spring. But Deinonychus itself was described by my undergraduate professor, uh, John Ostrom, and he was a Columbia graduate student, by the way. Uh, and uh, 
he described it as an extremely active animal. He was also the person who redeveloped Huxley's idea that birds are descended from dinosaurs. Now, Crichton said that the reason that he didn't use the name Deinonychus is simply because the similar dinosaur, Velociraptor, sounded much cooler. <laughs> Which I, you know, it's a, it's a legitimate point. Uh, so here's the Jurassic Park uh, from 1993. How many of you were alive in 1993? Uh, a few hands go up. So uh, that's how it looked like in 1993. It really didn't change. Supposedly, they used some of the wrong DNA to fill in the blanks. Uh, but if you compare the skeletons of Velociraptor and Anonychus, they're really similar. It's just that Velociraptor is much smaller. And if you really use the real Velociraptor, I don't think you'd have those great chase scenes. So through hypothesis development and testing and through the discovery of fossils that can either falsify or uh, corroborate hypotheses, like these incredible fossils we see from Chinese lake deposits here, with some of them even having, like on the right, the color preserved. From these, we know without any reasonable doubt that evolution between major groups of organisms is a fact, in the same way that gravity is a fact. That's a hypothesis too, but you don't want to fool with it. Uh, and these are continuing to be found every very, very, very often, almost every few weeks you read about a new one. You, you do some uh, exploring and uh, fossil hunting in China yourself. Yes, yes. In fact, that paper that you mentioned before was based on Chinese material. Uh, and we have ongoing projects there with Chinese colleagues in the Nanjing Institute. And it's really fascinating. These, these, these fossils are, of dinosaurs are very rare, but there are many other fossils in these same deposits that are very common. But you have to get about 100,000 other, other fossils to find one individual of one of these dinosaurs. So, in answer to the question posed by the name of this session, do dinosaurs still hold dominion? I would argue the answer is yes. There are roughly 4,500 to 5,000 species of dinosaur of, uh, of mammals. There are about 10 to 12,000 species of birds, which are dinosaurs. So we have a lot of chutzpah to say that uh, dinosaurs are extinct. They're not. They're alive now or that mammals rule the Earth because there are more than twice as many dinosaur species still around. And if we go extinct, or should I say when we go extinct, which will happen at some point one way or another, look at these guys. <laughs> They're ready. They're ready to take over. Okay. Questions? Like colors? Like colors and like where they stored their fat, like where, like do we know, like, yeah? <laughs> yeah, we do. Uh, so uh, at least for a, a larger and larger number of them. So for example, you saw these feathered dinosaurs. Their outline, their body outlines are clearly seen. They, they're, they're, they are still covered with remains of feathers and those feathers preserve cellular size structures now as fossils that are unique to particular colors. So we actually know, for example, that Sinoceropteryx, the very first one that was discovered with feathers, was, uh, was brownish and white with the kind of coloring that you see in a deer, you know, white underneath and darker on top. And so we're, we're, we're learning about that. Most dinosaurs we don't know the color of, but by using principles of homology, we can reconstruct their uh, their uh, musculature and where they would store fat and how they would breathe uh, with increasingly levels of precision. So these are buttressed by then great discoveries that are, discoveries that are found uh, and, uh, and we, we recognize those hypotheses to be very strongly supported and we would call them facts. I think that's one of the coolest things to come out of the study of dinosaurs is that we, you can actually tell what colors they were, what colors the feathers had. To me, that's one of those things. Growing up, I thought that's something you could never know. And now we do. Just as for Darwin, 
watching evolution happen. You know, that was something you could never do, and now we can. And from footprints, we can actually get a record, and do have a record from dinosaur footprints, of how dinosaurs moved, especially in deeper footprints, where you can back out using computer models how that foot had to move while the animal was alive. So we're getting closer and closer to extremely uh, realistic uh, understanding of how dinosaurs functioned. In the picture, one of the pictures that you showed us to let us guess if this is dinosaur or not, I remember one of them like looks very similar to chickens. But they were chickens. They were chickens, but yeah. you said like they were dinosaurs. Chickens are dinosaurs. Oh. All birds are descended from theropod, the carnivorous group of dinosaurs. And even if you look, do you eat chicken? Yeah. Okay. Look at, a, look at a chicken wing next time you're eating one, and you will notice that there is a thumb-like appendage on the wing. Oh. That has a claw on it. And many birds actually have claws on other digits as well. And there are three digits in the hands of birds. And there animals like Velociraptor and Deinonychus, as dinosaurs, have exactly the same proportions in their hand as you see in a chicken. With a, a, if we were familiar with seeing dinosaurs with feathers on them, as they were, we wouldn't have that break in our mind between dinosaurs and birds. As I said, dinosaurs, uh, birds are dinosaurs in the same way that bats are mammals. Just because they fly doesn't mean they're not the same big group of animals. Oh, I see. I'll share this information with my family every time we meet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank and, you. Sure. Oh, yeah, do you like gizzards? Do you ever eat chicken gizzards? Chicken gizzards. It's a hard, it's a muscular organ inside the chicken. It's a round thing. The, 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 so birds, many birds have, have well-developed gizzards, and uh, you'll often get them in fried food. And, uh, and uh, in the turkey, they're referred to as giblets, along with the heart and other parts. And uh, the gizzard is used to, to, they swallow stones, and then the stones grind up the food. Herbivorous dinosaurs had gizzards too, as did some carnivorous ones. We know that. I guess this is going back to evolution, kind of, but before Charles Darwin introduced natural selection, how did people explain evolution? That's a good question. So, actually, the idea that life all descends from some common ancestors and that uh, it evolves over time. Although people didn't use that word evolution back then for this, they used transmutation, the transmutation of species. That idea was around for a while. It was controversial, but even Charles Darwin's own grandfather had uh, written a long poem called Zoonomia, exploring that idea. So. The reason it didn't take hold is that nobody could figure out a mechanism to make it yeah. happen. Uh, there was a theory that probably many of us learned about in high school by uh, uh, a French naturalist named Lamarck that, say, the giraffe's neck got longer and longer because it kept reaching for higher and higher leaves on the trees. Like things they did in their life. Or something. Yeah, exactly. But um, that doesn't really work because our DNA doesn't change that, uh, that way in the course of an individual lifetime. Uh, so that theory, although there, there may be something there, that wasn't really going to explain the amazing tree of life. And it was Darwin's big insight, Charles Darwin's big insight, that natural selection over the course of a terrible drought like that, or a flood year, a wet year on Daphne Major, pushes the finches' beaks and bodies in a different direction, uh, that natural selection accumulating over generations could create new species and ultimately uh, these fantastic changes in body plans that Paul was telling us about. Yeah, okay, the, la the last question, perhaps? Hi. Um, do we have any evidence of like really famous dinosaurs being directly related to each other? Like I know 
uh, dinosaurs from completely different eras, from like Jurassic and Cretaceous, will be put together in like the similar movie because it's fun. But do we have any evidence at all that they're like related to each other through evolutionary trees? So there are uh, examples. In fact, there's a really nice one that it was in the news recently, a, a nearly complete skeleton of a Tyrannosaurus rex relative named Gorgosaurus went up for sale. It's older, it's smaller, and it has uh, more primitive features than what are seen in Tyrannosaurus rex, but it's clearly a very similar form. So we do have that sort of thing. We relate these organisms by the features they have, and then we can test that against finding other fossils and other features. So they are put into, uh, into their own family trees, if you will, by these methods, and we have a pretty good idea of how many of them are related to each other. I once asked Paul when he was visiting my class at the journalism school if he could draw the sort of family tree of dinosaurs. And um, it was the right question, and in some ways it was the wrong question, because like 20 minutes later, we had this huge whiteboard in the seminar, and Paul was still filling in all the different species and how they relate to each other. And it's an incredibly rich field where you can't imagine how much people have figured out over these generations and how much is known about dinosaurs. And, and a key thing to remember is these are not just stories about how, the, how they're related. They make predictions which can be tested. And if they're wrong, those predictions will come out wrong. So they have consequences. All right, so we hope you enjoy the show. <laughs>